really delighted to be here at Tata Literature Live. It's so nice to be back in person. Um, and very excited to be in conversation with uh, two creative personalities. One I'm going to assume is sitting over here, right here, till he actually lands up. But um, I, Malika, I have thoroughly enjoyed reading your book as I have enjoyed reading Unir's book. Um, I, loved, um, I loved your honesty, your candor, uh, the authenticity with which you write. Um, and uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was really refreshing for me. Um, I'd love to begin by asking you, you, you had a very provocative title for your book, and I'd love to start. For those of you who haven't seen the books, these are both the books. Um, um, your, you, you've titled your book, In Free Fall. Why is that? I think... Uh with all the kind of um, thought out decisions one takes in life, if one decides to tread an individual path rather than a path that has been determined by your family or your community or your caste or any of that, mm -hmm. then it pretty much is in free fall because you take audacious decisions, out of the way decisions, um, and then hope for the best. But mm -hmm. it's also great fun being in free fall mm -hmm. because uh, the end often surprises you. <laughs> Sometimes not. <laughs> Fair enough. If I can nudge you to share a few vignettes of your childhood and any, um, your growing up years and any key influences that shaped your thinking, what would those be? You know, uh, unbeknownst to most people, it was really my father who ended up doing the babysitting. Because long before he became very famous and then took over all the government scientific stuff, um, Amma was very, very famous and she was touring all the time. And uh, both the parents had decided that till the younger one, which was me, was 12 years old, there would always be one parent at home which meant that in most of my childhood crises, it was Papa who was there. Mm -hmm. And two things that really significantly, I think, formed the person I am. One was when I was five years old, I was on the first day of school in a Montessori school, and we were all sitting in a circle, and we were asked to draw a human face. And I drew the ears in the wrong place. And there was a little boy sitting next to me who said to me in Gujarati, tu to gadhedi che. you are an ass. Right. And I got really upset by this, so I went home and we have an open porch uh, as you enter. And I sat on the wall of the porch and howled and howled and Papa came. And he said, what's the matter? And he said, I'm not going back to that school. And he said, why not? And I said, well, this is what happened. And he called me a gadhedi. So Papa took me in his lap and he said, Mali, what are you? So I said, I'm a little girl. So he said, you know, you should feel sorry for this boy. He doesn't know the difference between a girl and an ass. And you do. So just feel sorry for him. So that was one very telling thing for me because what it really meant was that, hi, welcome. Welcome. You came faster than we thought. <laughs> hi, Oni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, but God. we expected yeah. that to have to carry on without you for a little longer, <laughs> so we're both delighted. Yeah. It, it made me realize that you can only be humiliated by somebody who give the power to humiliate you. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter what people say about you. I mean, that's their issue. If they think you're a whore, as I was called after the Gujarat um, pogrom in 2002, um, that's their issue. Why should it let me define myself by what other people say or think about me. The second was when I was about 12 years old. Uh, this was the time when a lot of East African Gujarati families were sending their children back to India while they transitioned to England or wherever it was. This was the Idi Amin period. 
and a lot of many older boys mm -hmm. came to my school because it was a it was a hostel mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. school. It was a mm -hmm. school where people could come, mm -hmm. and so there were like boys who were five or six years older than us in our class, mm -hmm. and two of them had a knife fight about whose girlfriend I was. Mm -hmm. I wasn't anybody's girlfriend. <laughs> right. And so one boy got, got knifed mm -hmm. and was taken to hospital. Mm -hmm. And parent was called. Now the parent happened to be the younger brother of the principal. So it was my aunt whose school it was. So Papa came in and I was sitting outside the principal's office and he was taken in. And he came out and I was sitting there fuming saying, you know, I hardly know these boys. And he was sort of grinning from side to side. And I, I said, why are you grinning? You know, I'm, I'm being hauled over the coals. And he said, I didn't think it would start quite so early. <laughs> and then he took me home and I said, yeah. this is all very unfair. And um, he sat me down and he said, you know, Mali, there are two kinds of people. There are people who follow what society expects them to follow. Mm -hmm. And there are others who decide that they want to follow a path where they decide what is right and what is wrong, not mm -hmm. what society mm -hmm. says or what, mm -hmm. what would be approved of. Mm -hmm. And both Mrinal and I have chosen that path. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd have this conversation with you when you were 17 or 18, mm -hmm. but I'm having it now. Mm -hmm. But think about what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I remember very clearly thinking about it very seriously for three days. Mm -hmm. And then going to him and saying, no, I have to follow my own truth. Mm -hmm. And I think if there were two defining things mm -hmm. in my childhood that made me the kind of person I am, I would say those were two of the very important ones. And, and you've done that unabashedly, and I'm going to come back to you in a minute, but um, Onir, welcome. I'm so delighted to see you. Uh, we started with discussing the titles of your books, and I felt both yours and Malika's titles were interesting and provocative. Um, and nobody was asking you, Onir, but you start with saying, I am Onir and I am gay. Why is that? Uh, I feel that in a space where you've grown up with people from the community being invisible, mm -hmm. being invisible myself for some time, for a long time, and when you look around and you see so many people from the community still being not able to just say openly that mm -hmm. you're gay, and you know, I, I was, there was a lot of discussion about what should be the title. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I think it's imp important mm -hmm. to, you know, just assert this aspect of my identity, which is very important because it's also so connected to the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, very often people t keep talking about it's a choice whether you want to come out and, you know, say I'm gay or lesbian mm -hmm. or trans, but mm -hmm. I feel that, you know, have you ever heard of a heterosexual having to make that choice or being in a closet? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, glorifying this whole, uh, you know, term that it's a choice, mm -hmm. it's a tragedy, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I feel that uh, because of that, I wanted to, you know, I feel that when, when I grew up, I had no reference mm. of my identity, you know, and I feel mm. so many young people write to me on social media, whatever, mm. trying to deal with how, to, trying to know how my journey was. Mm. And I feel that in a little way, maybe this is empowering that when you walk into a bookstore, mm. you mm. see a book mm. where, mm. You, you know, I'm gay is out there. Mm. And it mm. perhaps, I hope mm. that mm. it empowers mm. some more people to, mm you know, be proud. So I'd like to dig a little deeper into what you just said. I know, and I know in an early part of your book, you speak about realizing that your love was not acceptable to the world you lived in. And uh, that something priceless to you was considered sinful. Um, so I'd, I'd love to get, uh, you, and, and, and then you also go on to talk about uh, a secret identity that you created on the internet called Kamros, right? I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that. Walk us through what it's been like growing up, you know, knowing that you were gay and having, uh, and how you dealt with this identity over the years. Got difficult, a lot of things, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I yeah. think, uh, like when I was, uh, I was born and brought up in Bhutan and there, you know, I didn't even know till I was in school, I mean class 10, 
the word gay, you know. And I thought that it was normal for all boys to get a little physical, which everyone was. Mm -hmm. And one was eternally falling in love with girls. I was also falling in love, which was every time a disaster. But mm -hmm. I was like genuinely <laughs> falling in love. Yeah. And only when I came to Calcutta, uh, to study, that's when I slowly got to know, you know, when I was in Jadapur University and earlier to be, I got to know what is gay, you mm. know, at the mm. term and mm. to understand mm. the discourse. Mm. And also realizing that I was more attracted towards men. And I just decided, no, I don't know, I, nobody really told me, I didn't have any d discussion with anybody, but I just told myself I can't live a double life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> this is what I am and I'm going to figure out mm -hmm. how. Uh, and initially those days people generally didn't talk about sex so mm -hmm. much, mm -hmm. so I just thought that okay, you know, this, uh, though I was having sex, but uh, what mm -hmm. was not discussing it with too many people and mm. one of my best friends in college, he was gay, which I realized many years later, mm. you know, when mm. he went mm. off to UK, I came to Bombay and that's mm. when we discovered mm. and he was my closest friend. Mm. So there was that kind of silence and I think when I came to Bombay initially and those were the first years when the, you know, internet opened up and mm. there were these mm. chat rooms. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, I was considered to be this very shy person mm. in office mm. where I used to be working. Mm. And I created this, you know, so every night after uh, st the studio, after the work, I used to come back and I was 10 in the night, I would log in to the chat rooms. And I created this identity called Camros, mm -hmm. which for me was a, a, a mix of karma and eros. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and and uh, I would be another personality, you know. Mm -hmm. I would. Mm -hmm. I was like really uh, ex someone expressing desire and quite, uh, you know. I would sometimes go out and have, you know, meet three people in the middle of the night. And those days in Bombay, it was not. It was also dangerous, you know. There were right. people who would. Right. Right. You would end up being, I've ended up being mugged, blackmailed, robbed, mm. all, but it mm. didn't, you know, mm. I was talking mm. to one of my mm. friends, it, but it didn't stop us. Mm -hmm. You know, we were just exploring ourselves, you know. And I think uh, for me, Kamrose became that identity which let me, without fear, you know, explore my, you know, the unspoken part of myself. And at one point, mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, there were, initially there were like two different me's. And mm -hmm. then at one point mm -hmm. I was like, am I this honor who is shy and, you know, workaholic? Mm -hmm. Or am I this person mm -hmm. who is, yeah, who is just like, you know, I don't know what, <laughs> at right. the night right. person. Right. Well, thank you for sharing so, so honestly and freely. And just if I can ask you one add-on to that, give us a sense of how the community feels about inclusivity and acceptance in Mumbai today? I think, of course, it's changed. You know, I remember mm -hmm. when earlier, every Saturday night, we used to come to Voodoo's. There was this mm -hmm. one night club mm -hmm. in, uh, Mar uh, near uh, Church Gate. Sorry, not Church Gate, near uh, Gateway. That, And uh, sometimes there would be police raids. Mm. And we would have mm. to try and, you know, find mm. a way out through mm. the back door mm. and, mm. or we would have parties at uh, Mother Island, you know, white night party and then, you know, and I've been always lucky, you know, I leave and then I hear that it's been raided and <laughs> my friends have been, you know, lined up in the police station, but it was mm. horrible, mm. horrible to mm. think that just, you know, what are you doing? You're just mm. out like mm. other people having fun. You know, dancing. Being made to feel like so a that yeah, yeah. you know that has changed. Now you know you have spaces which is queer friendly, but it's not. It's only in few play in Bombay. I would say that I remember last year I had gone to Delhi and one of my assistants said that sir, let's go out to this nightclub. So both of us went, and this guy looked at us and says tags are not allowed. And I don't know what happened to me. I said, but you know he's my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> 
assistant he was like you had red in his face mm. but that guy he you know mm. he couldn't stop he knew that you know it could become something mm. so he says no no then you know he mm. went in mm. brought mm. It, uh, took us in mm. so i feel you are at least empowered to mm. you know ask for what should have been yours always sure you know sure. which mm. is what has changed and i mm. think that is mm. something i always felt in mumbai mm. much more mm. than any other city mm. in india so i i actually wanted to you wrote something very beautiful in your book and i wanted to to share it with the audience um you said we wait maybe many centuries later we will walk hand in hand in this land and claim what should have been ours till then my love let us in the shadows kiss and i thought that was so beautifully expressed uh, onir thank you malika moving on to you i uh, you have no qualms in sharing intensely personal facets of your life in this book um you you spoke open, you, you spoke about your, your you know battling an eating disorder you spoke about your addiction to alcohol you 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 spoke about experimenting with cosmetic procedures uh, and you spoke about your relationship with your children things that people would think twice and thrice before they you know they they share it what makes you uh, speak so freely and fearlessly you know i think there's just so much hypocrisy and lying and cosmetic mm. Mm. masks being put on mm. 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 and if i think that if if i am i am from the outside seen as somebody who is very strong mm -hmm. very bold stands up for things and comes from an extremely privileged family therefore has not had any trouble mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if by my sharing the fact that i'm still here standing i'm still standing with my beliefs i'm still standing with all my convictions but i'm standing because i've picked myself up again and again and again if that can like on it was saying if that can give courage mm. to other mm. people to mm. other women mm. to say it's okay then mm. that was one thing mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. second was mm -hmm. that having lived through this whole body business and being i've said in my book that i look at photographs or when i was starving myself mm. and i see a very thin woman mm. uh but that's not how i saw it then i think that having a healthy and fit body mm -hmm. that you can get at any age is the most important thing in life more than anything else because if you have a fit and a healthy body you can go out and do anything you can tackle anything mm. sure and why people make their bodies into waste baskets is something i can't understand mm. perhaps i thought that during covid with so many people dying at 28 of heart attacks and mm. things like mm. that forget mm. the covid deaths mm. but so many young mm. people mm. um mm. dropping dead i mean today an actor dropped dead in the gym mm. uh, mm. it's happening all the time why are we not taking control of the one thing that is ours the only thing in the world that is ours is our body mm. and our mind mm. everything else comes and goes mm. Mm. and i thought that if i could share this and get some people to understand mm. the importance of it but also that i have really shopped across the mm. world mm. Mm. for hidden ancient wisdoms mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. were poo-pooed by the west but mm -hmm. now suddenly the west is waking up to the fact sure. and there are i i don't know anybody else mm -hmm. personally mm -hmm. who can put like eight different forms of medicine next to each other mm -hmm. and be able to say from personal experience that mm -hmm. i have tried this and it works for this but not for this i have tried this and so on and so forth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i thought that was in today's world where more and more people are realizing the perils of allopathic medicine right i thought it's something that i needed to share yeah and if i have fallen flat on my face why should i be ashamed of it hmm. if i'm not standing i should be ashamed of that mm -hmm. if i have not been able to pick myself up i should be ashamed of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not otherwise 
Fair enough. Um, and I know that you speak about a whole range of alternative treatments in your book, and in, you know, for all those of you who pick it up, you can, you, you, you can delve into chromotherapy, mud baths, Ayurveda, the works. Uh, it was really fascinating to read about them. Uh, but uh, Malika wanted to move, pivot a little bit. Your mother was a classical dancer, and your father, Vikram Sarabhai, was a space scientist. How was your relationship with your parents? And how was your relationship with your children? And My son what, is sitting here, yes. so... And what has that, uh, what has parenting taught you? Parenting has taught me that one can never get it right. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you try, you will be blamed. Right. Um, being it's a found daughter... Words. Do you all agree with her? <laughs> no parents had that experience that you can never get it all right? Really? Oh, you can agree? You okay. Okay. Yeah. My relationship with my mother was extraordinary. I was always called her calf. Mm -hmm. And contrary to what I am today, I was an exceptionally shy child mm -hmm. and always hid in her pallu. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Difficult to believe Yeah, that. I know, I know. <laughs> so that's why I'm right. saying one can pick oneself up and change. <laughs> right, uh, yeah. I realized at the age of 11 mm -hmm. that Papa was having another relationship. Mm -hmm. And being as close as I was to Amma, mm. uh, I immediately took on a very protective role mm -hmm. and stopped speaking to my father completely and would urge my mother to leave him. Mm. And she would say, but I love him very much and he loves me very much. Mm. And I'd say, but he was, he's giving you so much pain. Mm. And she'd say, maybe when you're older, you'll understand. Mm. And... Uh, so I didn't speak to my father between the ages of 11 and 14. Mm -hmm. And at 14, we started having long conversations about ethics and morality and love and what was correct and what was not correct and what was right mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. was wrong. And, mm -hmm. uh, and in the context of the Bhagavad Gita, what, what sometimes you got drawn to things that you knew basically were wrong and that you were having issues with both, both the women you were in love with and so on and so forth. And I started realizing that while emotionally I was very like Amma, hmm. that my ethical framework was very much Papa's. Hmm. And it started developing then. Mm -hmm. And I lost him when I was 17. So I really only had three years, but it was an extremely intense and very, very close three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amma, luckily I had all my life. Mm -hmm. And contrary to what I say as a parent, I never had issues with Amma. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there were things like, don't wear a mini skirt and go to a something. Or, <laughs> you can't, you sounds, can't dress like that. That, that sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah but yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. it was nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was sort of passing irritations of yeah, a teenager. Yeah. Yeah, 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 there yeah. were no major issues. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which is why I am so traumatized by the estrangement from my own daughter. Mm. And, mm. I, and I don't understand it. I'm sure she's as much in pain, but we've mm. not found the place mm. yet to, mm. to, to meet. Mm. Mm. Um, but so that's parenting and that's childhood. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Unir, how uh, did your parents struggle with accepting your identity? Uh, actually, that's something that always surprised me yeah, okay. uh, because, yeah. you know, when I'm constantly asked about mm. how was it coming out mm. and I try and look back and I didn't really have any coming out and it was almost like, okay, my sister never came out, mm. <laughs> that's just straight. Mm. Mm. I used to maybe mm. give myself that mm. excuse mm. 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 and at some point, and I don't really remember because we didn't sit down and have this conversation, mm. I just realized that they were accepting me and then once there was a certain incident that happened and, you know, uh, it, I mean, uh, mm. in a newspaper mm. everywhere, it was mm. written that, you know, on near uh, mm. mm. openly gay director. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so uh, my mother and father, they were in Calcutta and, mm. you know, I was 
every morning I talk to them, so they called up and said, listen, we love you the most of all our children, and we like staying with you the most, and now they live with me. Right. And yes. uh, whenever uh, my boyfriends or relationships or one night stands would <laughs> come in, my father and mother would always treat them with respect and love. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how, mm -hmm. but uh, my entire family, my brother, my mm -hmm. sister, mm -hmm. no one ever, you know. That's incredibly yes, evolved, yes, right? I yeah. mean, that's a real sort of blessing. Um, I, I, I know the parenting has, 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 has taught me unconditional love, acceptance, and letting go. And, I, and none of this is easy. So, uh, so that's, that's, really, that's really heartwarming to hear. Onir, your love for theatre and film started at Lugair Theatre at Thimpu. Uh, walk us through this passion, how it got fueled when you went to Jadavpur University and then you went on to direct your first feature film, My Brother Nikhil, and of course several films after that. Um, I'd love to also hear if your identity has influenced both the type of films you choose to make um, and the challenges you faced making them in your book, you do allude to the fact that the industry is a bit homophobic. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, when we were in Bhutan, there was like one cinema hall there, and my mother always wanted to be an actress, and my mm. grandfather mm. Mm. didn't allow her. Right. And uh, so in Bhutan, every weekend there used to be a new film, and she used to just drag us to the theater, whether it's an adult film, you know, or, you know, we were kids and you're watching like Manthan and, you know, uh, Mandi and Julie, and everything, you know. And uh, at times she used to bribe us. If we said we don't want to go that, okay, you'll get this sweet or this or that. And uh, I think somewhere that started, you know, it stayed. Right. And right. I remember when I was in class eight, I think, I saw this film by Sham Bedingal called Junoon, mm -hmm. and I didn't understand, you know, at that time the film, but the visuals, and you know, there was this scene where Nafesa Ali just tells Shashi Kapoor, and the only dialogue she had in the film, saying, no, don't go away, you know, mm -hmm. stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just that moment just stayed, you know, those, mm -hmm. and I knew mm -hmm. that, okay, I didn't know how, but I knew I wanted to be a part of this, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and everything after that that I started doing right from, you know, my parents had admitted, wanted me to be a doctor, admitted me to a science college in Calcutta, I quietly shifted to arts, comparative literature, informed them after my name was struck out of the science, <laughs> three months later yeah. they were in Bhutan. And similarly, you know, I started mm -hmm. learning filmmaking mm -hmm. while in Jadapur University and went off to Berlin to train. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, and every time it was, in a way, I was letting down my parents and then that's what I keep telling, that it's okay because ultimately they will expect, accept and cherish you if they realize that you're happy doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And seven days before my post-graduation exams, when they thought that, okay, now he'll become a professor, if not a doctor, <laughs> I got this scholarship for filmmaking to Berlin. And right. I, and I left. Right. And my father was like really destroyed. He was like, okay, <laughs> now what? Right. Uh, but I think, and then coming to Mumbai and, you know, and with that just one dream, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. somehow I always told myself I have to make a firm. Mm -hmm. And if I don't respect what I see, mm -hmm. then I'll quit and do something else. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. wanted to have that one possibility and it took 10 years. But I don't really look at those 10 years as years of struggle and da da da. It was learning. It mm, was mm, m mm. getting to know people who believed in you and they all come together mm -hmm. and give you that energy and love to make what you... Because I always wanted to make the kind of films I do which is mm -hmm. not seen as something that makes money. <laughs> you know, not box office friendly. Mm. And it's my weakness in a way that, you know, money mm. never was the driving force. Mm. And, uh, and even you recently... struggled with it, right, yeah. for most of your movies. Even yeah. like, re even now, like yeah, yeah. about uh, a month back I was shooting uh, this film which was 
Uh, last year, the Ministry of Defense stopped me from making the film because though it's based on a real life story mm. of an army man falling in love with a civilian in Kashmir, mm. it was, uh, I was stopped. Mm. And a uh, year later, I decided like I'm, I was uh, made some changes and I was working on the film and everyone backed out and uh, just before, one week before the shoot, luckily my life insurance, which I had invested 30 years ago, <laughs> matured and I just said, okay, this goes. And my family was livid, you right. know, that, oh, you're saving and I'm like, right. Right. but you know, I'm happy. This is what gives me the most mm -hmm. happiness. Mm -hmm. I don't need to have a house or a car or any, mm -hmm. but every time I make my films, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and okay, good, bad, ugly, it's mine. Delightful. And uh, pivoting to you, Malika, you are an accomplished Kuchipudi and Bharatanatyam dancer. You formed the Darpana Academy of, of, of Dance. Tell us what dance has... No, I didn't. My parents started it in 49, much before I was born. Right. I right. have been running it since 1977. You've been it. I stand corrected. But tell us a little bit about what dance has meant to you. You write about it very beautifully in your book. I'd be delighted to, to even have you read maybe a little bit from your book. Yeah. The only thing I knew when I was growing up was that I didn't want to be a dancer. <laughs> right. It was too much hard work and I didn't right. think I had it in right. me because I've seen my mother dance in such dire situations, you know, with septic feet and with being given injections mm. between uh, mm. items mm. As, and in great pain. And, mm. and I thought, this mm. will mm. I would watch the curl up and read a book or something. But I loved being on stage. Mm. So I went, I first trained as a puppeteer mm. as a child mm. and mm. started touring with the Darpana Puppet mm -hmm. Company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then went into theatre and was in all the school and college plays and in mm -hmm. the IM mm -hmm. plays mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm because that was not physically so arduous. Mm -hmm. And it was, but I studied because mm -hmm. all my friends were in my mother's class and there was nobody to play with when mm -hmm. that was happening. So mm -hmm. I had always studied, I had always been told I could be a dancer because I used to win all the competitions, the school and college competitions. Mm -hmm. And still very seriously didn't want to dance. And um, mm -hmm. went into IM, did my PhD, uh, fell in love, broke it up, and went into a very severe depression for many months. And uh, literally, one day woke up saying, what am I doing? All I want to do is dance. Mm. And this was like four years after Papa had died. Mm. And Amma had lost interest in dance because Papa was always her partner, mm. you know, that she would share her creativity mm. with mm. and so on. Mm. So for Amma, it became like a second inning mm. that her daughter had wanted mm -hmm. to and we had this amazing partnership mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact we actually created a show called Two Lives in Dance and Two More because my son Revanta at the age of five decided that he wanted to dance mm -hmm. uh, completely mm -hmm. unlike me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, started touring with us when he was 12 or 13 mm -hmm. and Amma had done an autobiographical show. Uh, Sangeet Natak Academy was uh, celebrating 50 years and had mm -hmm. asked the sort of greats like Birju Maharaj and Amma and people like that mm -hmm. to create something and Amma did a, Amma danced her life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, talking and dancing mm -hmm. and I loved mm -hmm. the show and I said let's do it so the two kids and Amma and I did it together several wow. times and it was, it was very special. Yeah. But dance means more to me with every passing day. Mm -hmm. It uh, it's everything for me. It's, uh, I dance when I'm depressed, I dance when I'm happy, I dance when I'm bored, I dance when I'm angry. And I don't mean classical dance, it just means putting on some music and mm -hmm. dancing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, 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 it's something that I find as I, as I grow older, Bharatanatyam becomes more and more important. I've just created a performance called Past Forward which is the evolution of Bharatanatyam and the heroine, the mm -hmm. Naika in Bharatanatyam mm -hmm. over a thousand mm -hmm. years from the 12th century till just now. Mm -hmm. And I find it a language where I can speak about anything in the world, mm -hmm. the most mm -hmm. modern things I can mm -hmm. speak about. And mm -hmm. that gives me a flexibility that, uh, mm -hmm. that I find very invigorating. Mm -hmm. 
So, Malika, you were a dancer. What drove you to fight the establishment in uh, 2002? How did it um, affect you? And if you had to relive your life, would you do it? I would do it again. You would do it again? Okay. You know, I come from a family... <laughs> yeah. I come from a family where women from both sides have fought injustice for over 150 years. I have been handed that baton. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the one thing I knew growing up, not because anybody told me, but seeing these women, um, is that you, if you were privileged, hmm. and if you had a voice, you had to raise it when things were not right for the voiceless. Mm -hmm. So I had been doing it apolitically as mm. a child. I remember mm. in the same school and mm. against my aunt sitting on a dharna because a male teacher and a female teacher who were married to other people were having a relationship. And the woman got punished but not the man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember very clearly at the age of 10 sitting on dharna because I thought that was wrong. Mm. Mm. And then again in IIM, I have IIM friends sitting here, <laughs> in the IIM, when we got in, we were mm. nine women and there were no, na uh, mm. there were no hostels. Mm. Mm. So we were put three to a room mm. and it was terrible. So I remember in the summer between the first and second year sitting on a dharna outside the director's office till he promised us a hostel. Mm. So mm. fighting for things was in my DNA. But when 2002 happened, mm. Mm. it was just so horrendous and mm. so obviously planned. Mm and so meticulously planned, mm. that there was no way that I could stay quiet. Mm. And, and, how I, and how did it impact you? How does it impact me? Mm. Oh, wow. In every which way, um, the more powerful the establishment becomes, the more frightened the world is of them, the more their tentacles reach out, mm. um, a whole flurry of false cases were filed mm. against me. Mm. I had to give up my passport for nearly two years. I had to be at the police station every morning and every after evening. I had to report uh, because a student, a part-time student of mine filed a case that I had promised to let her illegally migrate to America and I had cancelled the tour when I found out that some, some of them were planning to migrate. Mm. And so she filed a case of fraud that I had promised to let her illegally immigrate. And then I didn't let her, so therefore I was causing fraud. It's like saying that if I'm going to rob a bank and I take a ride from somebody and that person has a flat tire, hmm. I file a case against that person for stopping me robbing a bank. <laughs> and for this, I had to go up to the Supreme Court hmm. Hmm. to get my passport back hmm. after two years of being at a police station morning and night. Wow. Um, and it continues. And did it take a toll on your, on your mental... I said that's when I started drinking. It's a, it's, a, it's a daily fight. Mm. There's not a single day mm. that I don't feel the repercussion. Mm. Mm. And it's been very hard. Running an institution has become very difficult. Mm. Mm. But we are standing. So, I'd, I'd love to take some questions from the audience. I'm going to ask you one last question to both of you, actually. The title of the session is, is, is Lost and Found. Could you define what, um, what loss means to you and what you seek? I seek a just world, a world where nefarious criminals don't make decisions for us, a world where people can treat other human beings in a humane fashion. And all the work that I do is trying to take a tiny step mm -hmm. towards making that world. So in my case, it's find and find and find more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My losses have been personal, mm -hmm. but what I have found is myself, and I continue finding a new me every day.
Uh, I think for me, what I constantly seek now is you know, and space is not just here, it's not mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. about me. And define but loss as well on you, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Loss uh, somehow always for me becomes about love, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. not being able, you know, uh, not being able to find it because of fear, mm -hmm. of someone else's fear of being, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing their. Mm -hmm. Mm. love or being able to mm. and mm. you know very often everyone tells me oh why do you always fall in love with the wrong person mm. uh, and I'm like you don't pre-decide and plan mm. you know mm. and you go into a journey believing that you'd reach mm. S mm. somewhere maybe but you don't know when and where mm. it just you just realize that you know suddenly it's you know I, I, I don't know for me loss is every time I've lost someone uh, in a relationship very closely. Right. And, and, uh, and I know you mentioned that in the book as well. In, yeah, yeah, that is something yeah, that, yeah. you know, yeah. I miss in yes. my life. I yes. feel that yes. vacuum. Yes. And, but what I seek is, you know, and that's what makes me do the kind of work I do is, you know, what really, really troubles me, uh, makes me keep, uh, is when I see across the world, you know, that in 2022 also so much of the world does not even think that you deserve to live. Mm. And it really breaks my heart when, you know, like right now I've been trying to help uh, some f students from Afghanistan mm. f find refuge because, mm. uh, you know, some of their friends have just been killed because they... Mm. Uh, from the queer community and uh, and to be here and not to be able to help because they you know they're Afghans and they're Muslims and then our refugee policies mm. don't mm. easily you know mm. 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 and to feel so helpful that someone is waiting there mm. helpless that someone is waiting there and you don't know if mm. Mm. suddenly you realize that there is no reply to your message, mm. you know. Mm. So mm. I think that is what I mm. seek, over, you know, to, in whichever way one can, to create a space where we don't need to be scared to love, to mm. be ourselves. Mm. Terrific. Thank you for these really wonderful, honest, uh, moving sort of um, vignettes from your life. Love to open this out for questions. Uh, maybe we can start with you. Are there are there mics? Is there, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. He's just coming down. He's just coming down. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, thank you for a very fascinating discussion and lovely insights and very beautifully moderated too. <laughs> now, uh, question each to Onir and Malika. Uh, Malika, I would like to ask you on parenting. You had a set of extraordinary parents who, of course had uh, great achievements to their name. And um, is there anything in particular that they did or you remember where, because you see a lot of children being stunted by the weight of their parents' brilliance and never ever kind of reaching those heights themselves. Mm -hmm. And given that you've been very accomplished yourself, do you think that there was anything in that parenting, if there's anything tangible, subconscious, etc which ensured that, you know, in spite of all the brilliance of your parents, you were an individual in your own right. So that's my question to you. And Onir, of course, this has been a great journey, and thank you for kind of taking us through it. But, uh, you know, how did you feel when the Supreme Court decriminalized homosexuality? What was, what was the instinctive reaction for yourself, the community, and how was it? So, I, I mean, these are the two questions I thought I'd put to both of you. And thank you again uh, for, for such a fascinating mm -hmm. discussion. I think uh, in 2012, when first the Supreme Court, you know, the High Court, Delhi High Court, I'll just go back to that. And I remember that, uh, you know, uh, I was in the airport when it happened, and I just started crying there, and people were looking at me that, what is wrong with this? Mm -hmm person, you know. Uh, and then it got, when it got overruled again, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking that you thought that finally. So when in 2018 again it was coming up, honestly, one, because 
uh, when it got overruled by Supreme Court, we were all planning to party because we didn't think it will happen. So this time we were really cautious. afraid, cautious, <laughs> planning nothing and just waiting. And when it happened, I was numb. You know, and then my just phone kept ringing because, you know, channels, everyone. And honestly, I was talking mechanically because it had not, it was not real. You know, and it became real much mm -hmm. later. You know, I think that a lot of parents are frustrated because they were not allowed to do and be who they were. And a lot of this frustration goes into expectations from their children. Both my parents were deeply fulfilled in what they did and believed that parents are like gardeners. They have to provide the soil and the water, but the plant has to grow whichever way it grows. So the one thing that Papa told me is, you know, I went into films when I was 16. My first film was when I was 16. And the only thing Papa and Amma both said to me is that don't quit studying. Uh, and I had no intention of any way. But I think the fact that we, both Kartikeya, my brother and I, always felt that they were prouder of the two of us than they were of any achievements. And that all achievements were really to come and say, here I've got this because I love you. We felt very much a unit, which was why it was so devastating when Papa died so suddenly and so young. But it was always, it's about us, not about them versus us, or not about me versus what are my expectations of you. The expectations were to be humane human beings. The expectations were to give back to society. Not that they ever said that, but we saw them doing that. We saw them both involved in making differences in people's lives. We saw the whole family doing that. And I think, uh, I often say that Papa and Amma must be laughing because uh, neither of us took science or whatever, but both my brother and I work in the field of development. And that is really what Papa was. Papa was never a scientist for the sake of being science. It was always for him something that translated into how does it make a difference to the last Indian. Amma's dancing was the same. She danced about dowries and she danced about untouchability and she danced about, you know, so it was, it was to, to, to change society and I think both Kartika and I are involved in doing that. So obviously, they succeeded. They manipulated right. <laughs> Thank you. More power to you. A question over here and then a question there. Yeah. Um, Malika, this question is for you. Um, hearing your external journey has been incredible. Um, you've clearly lived your life literally on the edge and you've experienced so many things. Um, I have a question about your internal journey. How has everything that you've experienced um, changed you from the inside? And after having experienced all of this, what do you see is the purpose of life? Not, not externally, but in a sense, what's the reason that you, you exist? Why, why were you born internally? I, I don't know if the question's clear. Yeah, I have spoken about this a lot in the book. I have had to find the internal resources or find and search for those things that will give me the internal resources to be able to put back the broken pieces. And it started very early with Papa's death. It completely devastated me. I'm still, there's still no closure. As against my mother's death, where she very much said goodbye to us uh, and left. So it, I still, have nightmares about Papa's not being around. And I still miss him terribly every day. And as I said, there's zero closure. For many years, I went on saying, why? Till I realized that there are some questions that can't be answered there. There are some things that the why doesn't, doesn't cut it. So in each of these cases, uh, I have had to develop the resources, go outside, find things that help, whether it's in Papa's case, it was transcendental meditation that was taught to me many years later. In the case of my daughter, and it, it devastated me completely. And then I realized that my being devastated wasn't helping anybody. 
it wasn't helping me, it wasn't helping the many people I worked with, it wasn't helping my performance which reached hearts. And I had to find the resources to detach myself enough to be able to become a working whole individual again. So every time the search continues for, for a different thing to be able to do it. What I think mine and anybody's purpose in life is, is I think to make life a little more fragrant. Question there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're just handing her a mic. Yeah. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Uh, uh, this was a very like insightful discussion. I mean, uh, I gained a lot from this. Uh, being a queer person myself, uh, it it was really, you know. Uh, I have this one question for you, sir, that uh, in the community itself, there is uh, phobia, like there's biphobia, there's lesbian phobia, there's lesbophobia, and th there are slurs, and how we uh, have reclaimed some slurs, some we haven't. And uh, uh, my question is that uh, me being a queer person, it took me years to use the word lesbian itself to identify uh, myself because whenever I searched the word, the first thing that came up for a 12-year-old was that it was literally porn. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing that came up. And even uh, how uh, th that has become a major thing and... Uh, if, even if you search on Instagram, there are no, uh, like, you know, uh, meme, pa meme pages or something. There is just like girls kissing girls, women sex, women sex, and that is. And uh, even uh, like, uh, uh, there was this one case that happened in London. Uh, two women were uh, uh, very cozy, so they were asked to kiss by a group of teenagers and when they didn't they got hit so that really bothered me and things like this when they happen in like there is phobia within the and the change is happening but yet there is so much that is not yet happened and there's so much yet to happen so my question is about the same that what about the uh, uh, phobias within the community between I think all of us have grown up with patriarchy in us, you know, and uh, very often people will say that, okay, you know, women are the biggest, it's one of the th biggest enemies of mm -hmm. women because, mm -hmm. but we forget that, you know, right from childhood, you know, we have been seeped with the same information, you know, and today it takes a while, you know, there are, you know, I f find there are a lot of filmmakers uh, who are from the community, you know, but making films which are not necessarily projecting the community in the way one, you know, one is made mock, uh, mocked at, one is demeaned, and that's f supposed to be funny, you know. And when you are queer, it does not necessarily make you someone who is aware of these elements, you know. And I feel that it is okay to not to, you know, you have, one has to, I know, deal with all this, but I always try and think that, yes, there has been a lot of negative energies around, but there's been more people who loved and, you know, accepted, and I feel that our definition is not just our sexuality, it's much beyond that, and if someone, I always told myself that if someone doesn't accept me, it's their loss. You know, so celebrate yourself, you know, and celebrate the beauty in you and the world will come together and recognize Can it. I give you an example of what you are saying that has recently happened in Gujarat? There's been a big sociological survey uh, done by the SEPT University on trying to understand atrocities against Dalits. And they were researching atrocities from upper castes against Dalits and from Dalits against Dalits lower down. 
and they found 94 different ways in which the upper castes treated Dalits badly, and 97 ways in which upper caste Dalits treated lower caste Dalits. It's exactly the same thing as you are asking. That, and what Oni just said, that just because a Dalit is a Dalit, doesn't mean that he or she is suddenly enlightened. Yes. A Dalit man will still hit a Dalit woman, just as any man who does violence. And it doesn't change just because you are amongst the minority or amongst the oppressed. Maybe time for. Yep. Uh, hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my question is to Onir, sir. Uh, I would like to ask that there was this movie, Dostana. Uh, I would like to ask that, uh, you know, what difference. Uh, you know, like the phase before Dostana and after Dostana, like what difference did it make? Uh, you know, it's like I've been always told that, oh, you sound like grapes are sour. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my problem is, you know, when people tell that, okay, at least there is a discourse happening in mainstream space, you know, and you see right now suddenly it's also very cool to, uh, for actors, you know, to, to play gay or trans. And I find it very, very disturbing because one is, you know, for me, when Dostana happened, yes, people started talking about, but at the end of the day, ma color ka bigar gaya. You know, in India, it's very common for men or women to show a certain kind of physical affection, which is, you know, it, everything does not have to, it, there's a thin line and it's absolutely okay and beautiful, but suddenly two guys holding hands would become Dostana, and people, you know, I would feel uncomfortable sitting in a theater when I suddenly feel that everyone is actually laughing at me. You just suddenly feel isolated in that space because mm -hmm. if a guy and a girl mm -hmm. are walking hand in hand, no one laughs. Mm -hmm. So for me, honestly, for me, uh, Dostana does not exist as a milestone. You know, for me, I would talk about, you know, if I had to think, I would think, Indian cinema before fire and after fire. Fair enough. Question up there. Maybe the maybe one and maybe one more after that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question to Anir that uh, which way we should define the marriage of LGBTQ community. Mm. Um, like uh, normal, I um, have understanding of the marriage of uh, male female, but I don't have understanding of L marriage of LGBT community. And another um, small question I have with, um, to Malika, ma'am. So, I'm in Hindi. So, um, it's like a cycle. Hai. Uska aage wala tire hai, wo almost free, but it's less weight. And it's less weight. It's less weight. It's less weight. A car is a balance. Alag अब कार में बैठने वाला आदमी कहता है कि उस साइकिल का पीछे वाला टायर है उसके साथ ना इंसाफ हो रही है इसको ठीक करना चाहिए और मुझे जो फेमिनिज्म है एक्जेक्टली इसी तरह का लगता है जो अपर समुद्र अपर मतलब अपर लेवल की महिलाएं जो जैसे आपने कहा एक दलित दूसरे दलित पे अत्याचार कर रहा है पीछे वाला टायर आगे वाले टायर पे अत्याचार कर रहा है ये कार में बैठ के साइकिल का ये एनालिसिस करना ही ऊपर मतलब ऊपर के लोग जो फेमिनिज्म बताते हैं ना वो मुझे एक्जेक्टली ऐसा ही लगता है क्योंकि आपको साइकिल चलानी नहीं आती है आपको साइकिल की अंडरस्टैंडिंग नहीं है मुझे ऐसा लगता है हो सकता है मैं गलत हूं और इस पे आपका क्या विचार है ऑनेस्टली आई वाज नॉट टू क्लियर अबाउट योर क्वेश्चन बट इफ यू आर सेइंग व्हाट इज मैरिज फॉर इट इज जस्ट लाइक व्हाट इट इज फॉर एवरीवन एल्स and uh, you know, a lot of people want to also wear designer clothes and have a big fat gay wedding or lesbian wedding or trans wedding. And uh, so it is just about, you know, there is this beautiful thing that marriage is actually just union of two souls. Gender does not matter, sexuality doesn't matter. I'm also not sure that I'm clear about your um, question. 
डिड आई अंडरस्टैंड करेक्टली दैट यू सेट कि गाड़ी वाले को बाइसिकल वाले की बात नहीं करनी चाहिए क्योंकि उनको तो बाइसिकल चलाना ही नहीं आता इज दैट वॉट योर क्वेश्चन वॉज हाँ सो वॉट वॉज द क्वेश्चन हाँ तो this is a whole other discussion that you and i can have separately or because mai kafi kaam kar chuki hu mahilaon ke sath pichle 40 saal mein aur dalit mahila aur dalit purusho ke sath bhi to what onir was saying earlier that patriarchy is inbuilt in us and unless we actively fight it and actively fight it on a daily basis kahin na kahin to patriarchy bahar aa hi jati hai let Okay, let let let's take this discussion. You can you can continue this discussion with Malika after the after we conclude. Paula, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah my question is for Malika. You grew up in Gujarat, in the land of Gandhi, uh, and clearly, clearly you've imbibed uh, you know uh, some of the Gandhian tra uh, traits in you. <coughs> in today's Gujarat, in today's uh, society. um is there a gandhi who will inspire activism the kind that you are doing uh how do today's people who as a society how do we sort of frame our activism or our empathy um and how do we keep gandhi alive and if gandhi has played a role in your uh, upbringing uh, because your parents grew up in a gandhian era you were post gandhi so just you can throw some light on that i am very gandhian in some very fundament fundamental ways um i respect the work of the hands and i hope that i don't make a hierarchy of the brain being more important and therefore the people who work with their minds being more important than people who work with their hands uh gandhi has no place except on the posters of swachh bharat today he has become a pair of spectacles that are for toilets uh and you must remember that gujarat has been ruled by this party for 27 years there are uh, two generations of young people who have never even realized that the gujarat i was growing up in was very different and uh, there is no conversation uh today about uh, gandhi ji uh and i think it's uh, something that's spreading across the country very rapidly has spread across the country very rapidly but i think uh, in our individual capacities if we have a certain set of beliefs then we should try and fight for that india and try and fight for an india that i hope some of you here believe in and i think it's up to each and every one of us to do that I want to be mindful of time it's uh, really difficult to unpackage lives which have been as rich and varied and for all of you who are still curious I urge you all to pick up copies of their books um I just want to wish you Malika Unir and to all of you in the audience good luck with with losing and finding and navigating this trapeze act called life Thank you everyone. Good night.